we're going to share a few principles with you this evening. We're here to uh, talk about wealth. We're here to talk about wealth in all its forms. <coughs> different people have different ideas about wealth. Some people just trans translate the word wealth into money. Some people think that wealth and money are interchangeable. And you're going to find out over a long period of time that wealth and money are not interchangeable. <laughs> but the only part I'm going to talk about for the next little while is principle number one, which is think. A big element in learning how to build wealth and control wealth and, and secure wealth and protect wealth and pass wealth on to the next generation is it's all about how you think. And you're going to find out that more, more money has been lost because of the way that people think than because of bad investments, bad choices, bad advisors, bad advice from your neighbors, your bowling buddies, your golf partners, your friends, um, especially uh, anybody ever asked their doctor for financial advice? <laughs> Come on now. I used to ask my doctor for financial advice because I just assumed that people who make a lot of money know how to invest it. They know how to take care of it. And now another example about, about think is that I've come across people who make maybe, pick a number, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars a year. They make very modest income and yet they're able to amass 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 dollars in savings. Remember that old fashioned thing, that savings account that we used to actually make money on? <laughs> now if you're in Europe you have to pay the bank to hold your money. But I come across people who think like savers. They think like, like people who want to practice thrift. And so they know that no, no matter what the market does, they want to save. And then I have other clients who have come to me and said, glad we're not going to mention names this evening. They've said, listen, we make forty, <laughs> fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 per month, and we're living paycheck to paycheck. Do you know anybody like that? I, I have a lot of people who are, who are close to me. They might even be relatives in different parts of the country who have scarcity thinking, who have defeatist thinking, who have said to me, literally, we've accepted that we will never have a lot of money. We've accepted that we will ma never make a lot of money, we'll ma never be able to save a lot of money, and we're looking forward to retirement so that we can collect Social Security. <laughs> and, and this evening we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about the majority, but what I just described is the majority of Americans. Because if you, if you poll your friends, you'll find out that most of them are saving about 5%. 5% of their income. And if you do the math, which we can do at other times, you'll find out that saving 5% of your, of your income is not going to see you through in retirement, especially if you have a long life. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So the first principle of prosperity is it's all about how you think. So let's, let's give a couple of examples about how people think about money. Now to a lot of people, the stock market per se is a mystery. Anybody here? Um, that doesn't know exactly how the stock market works? <laughs> Anybody here uh, not trust the stock market? Some people have told me, I, I never want to go through 2008 or, or, or pick, a, pick a year, 2001, 2003, years where we had really big downturns. But there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but you, we can have an up market and you can still lose money. So let's talk about uh, the way you think as concerns average rate of return. You've probably heard that, that term before. Now if we say something this evening that you don't identify with or would like the definition of, just raise your hand because like I'm fond of saying, I went to a small public college in New Jersey so I'm not going to use a lot of 25 cent words. So let's talk about an average rate of return. Would you be happy receiving a 25% rate of return? I would, but my lawyer friends and some of my accountant friends would say, it depends. So let's test that for a second. So let's put, um, 
we're not going to have any present value. We're going to put a thousand dollars a year, which is what you like to do. I like to do both. Okay. Well, we can we can switch it off. So this is just a simple calculator. We're going to start off with a thousand dollars, and we're going to double our money in the first year. Okay with that? Double our money in the first year. We're going to lose fifty percent in the second year. Had a little bit, little bit of a downturn. We're going to double our money again in the third year, and we're going to lose half of our account in the fourth year. Now, that may, oh, we can't see the bottom there. Okay, if, if those of you that could see the bottom, two things are happening here. We're talking about averages, which, which means we took four years worth of returns, and we added them up, we divided by four, and that gave us an average rate of return of 25%. Now, you're not gonna believe this, but Wall Street is allowed to advertise that rate of return. Now this hypothetical person put $1,000 in an account, four years later, before we add any other variables, four years later this person had $1,000. Started with 1,000, ended with 1,000. <laughs> but when you, when you look at the average rate of return, you got 25%. What's, what's missing there? Well, maybe common sense. <laughs> right? But Wall Street is allowed to tell us that we earn 25% from this investment. And when they come up with those beautiful flyers and those 600 page uh, prospectuses that nobody reads, they're allowed to put their track record in this hypothetical investment and say, you earn 25% on this investment. It, it can get a tad bit worse. Do you want to switch over and put an annual? Or let's just add a, let's just add a fee because presumably, you're going to pay some rocket scientist to advise you on your money during this period of time. So let's assume that you paid that genius 1%. So now you're underwater a little bit. And let's assume that not every single dollar that you ever save or invest goes into a 401k. We can have that discussion later. I think Cameron might have a few uh, points about that. <clears throat> but let's assume that you're in a taxable account. That means when you had that first year's worth of gain, you actually had to pay income taxes on it. So in the second year, when you lost money, you were underwater. You with me? Okay. So at the end of four years, we started out with 1,000. We ended up at the bottom there with $697. That's on a, and why don't you point out the uh, rates of return. The average rate of return was 25%, and your real actual rate of return was negative 8% and change. Well, part of it is paying attention. Part of it is, is not doing all of our homework, because we're responsible for our own, our own results and our own education. And part of it is taking people's word when they advertise something to us. So all that, that glitters isn't gold, all that appears on the surface isn't necessarily the whole story. So let's take that down and let's look at... Do you want to do if we do it annually? Oh, sure. Let's see if we can make more money by not starting out with $1,000. We're just going to put $1,000 per year into our account. And maybe by some magic, we'll make more money. It kind of reminds me about, um, about people suggesting that we put money into IRAs or 401ks because we will make money on the government's money. That's another one of those apparent uh, truisms that doesn't seem to work out when you do the math. So okay, we put $1,000 a year and we wind up losing a lot more money. Gee, that, that, that's probably not uh, something that you want to tell your, your golfing buddies about. Agreed? Okay, how about if we take a different approach? I have a question for you, John. For sure. Isn't that interest rate really compounded? So the first year I've got $1,000 in there, and the second year is 2000 So now I'm making 25% of 2000 versus 1000 which your account relations have stayed at the 1000 Well, did you already erase it, or did you minimize it? Okay, here's the, here's the thing. You weren't making 25% on anything. What they're advertising is just adding up those four years worth of returns, 100 minus 50, 100 minus 50. The total of those numbers 
is 100. You with me? Divided by 4 is 25%. It's hypothetical. You didn't really make 25%. I, I get that part. But All they're doing is adding up the math. Right, they're not adding up dollars. Okay. Well, it's not interest. It, no. It's the value of the securities, and you're saying that the market is the return versus compounding interest. What I'm saying is there's a difference between averaging numbers and looking at real dollars. That's why we talk about average versus actual. The average was just totaling up the average rates of return. It had nothing to do with any dollars that might have been in a hypothetical account. And so people look at that and, and they make decisions on their future based on what they perceive might be the, the truth. Let me give you another example. Uh, you, had your, you had your guy in the 30% tax bracket and with a loss of 50%. Can you write that loss off as a deduction and use it as a tool for something else? Or? Passive losses. There are, there, there are limits when you have capital losses. Like if you have a gain, you got to pay tax on all gain, but you have a loss, your losses are... Uh, limited to a, so typically three thousand uh, dollars a year so there is a th so there's an opportunity to cut your losses by taking a tax deduction for losses okay so that's that's a road that we really don't want to go down too far because then we're comparing well I lost 14 percent in the market last year how much did you lose well I lost 30 percent in the market and so let's go to our tax returns and see who got the better bang for our buck based on how much money we lost. Okay, so what we, tr what we want to do is, is get away from the thinking that says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to base my, my wealth plan on some number that I pulled out of the sky or some number I pulled out of a prospectus or some number that somebody told me I could make. Okay, so... These are all hypotheticals. That's, that's a total hypothetical just to get you acquainted with the idea of actual versus average, yeah. right? And, and you can see it's actually... But even if at a hypothetical, the numbers just, they still add up just for the Well, I mean, math is math, right? Right. right? And, and, we, and we want you to understand how the math works. So how about if we, if we increase our return, I just offered you 25%, most of you said you'd take it. Now I want to offer you 70%. Give me a second on that one. Yes, sir. So you're saying that basically you shouldn't offset your losses by selling a stock that is... No, no, this is not a, this is not a class on stocks. Okay. I've only been a stockbroker for 35 years. I don't know anything about the stock market. Okay, <laughs> okay. So, so I tell my clients, th and this is, this is what I believe, I believe that 90% of the people don't belong in the stock market because I don't think you should invest money in something you don't understand fully. But we can have a separate discussion about the technicalities. What I'm just trying to get is an overview, okay? And I have to get off in 20 minutes, otherwise these guys yank me. Thank you. But absolutely can talk about how to, uh, we could talk to Anthony, who's a CPA, about how to deduct losses. Right. The, the last thing that we want you to do is have losses. That's why we're here. <laughs> we're trying to go in this direction, okay? So what if I said to you that there was a certain investment that uh, went up by 70%? You started off at, um, yeah, let's, let's give me that calculator, that, well, that, that rate calculator. That We're talking about uh, hypotheticals. I'm going to tell you what it is in a minute. But if somebody started out with $10,000 and they finished up with $18,000, round numbers, that's an 80% rate of return, isn't it? Well, wait a minute. I didn't give you all the information. It's an 80% increase. We don't know what the rate of return is because we, don't, we haven't put any years in there, have we? So, uh, and I know I'm gonna make you crazy, but I really like doing it live this way. So, so show the market history. From, um, really, let's say 2000 to 2015. Yeah, that doesn't show the Dow, the number. So if you look at April 1st, 1999, the Dow was at 10,000. You have to take my word for that. You can go back and look it up. It was around 10,000, 98.76, I believe. 
Last Thursday, the market was about 17,896, okay? So if we have a beginning point of 10,000, this is boring, isn't it? <laughs> if we have a beginning point of 10,000 and we have an ending point of 17,896, 18,000 is good. But the number of years it took us to get there was roughly 17. So let's put 17 years in that calculator. It's actually 17 and a half because it was April 1st. So wh what actually happened in the, in the uh, I'm sorry, it wasn't the Dow at all, it was the S&P. It was the S&P 500 because we wanted to use the best of the best. Going backwards. That's the Dow. Let's stick with the Dow. So we thought we made 80% over that period of time. We thought we made 80%. What we actually made was 3.5%. Now, how many folks do you know believe that the stock market is the best and last place to put your money? And you know what? This is not a class to say that's not true. We're actually just trying to expose some, some fallacies in, in, in people's thinking because a lot of folks assume that they should just put their money in the stock market because that's where people put their money to get wealthy. And I, I'll just tell you, I've been doing this for 40 years and I haven't had one client become rich by using the stock market. That's kind of a powerful statement when you think about it. Most people become rich by doing other things, by opening a business, by, by creating an invention, by doing things the old-fashioned way, by saving. So let's, let's give a, a last example and let's go to the last 20 years of market history and look at actual numbers. So uh, show me a market history from 1996 to 2015. So over on the right-hand side, and again, we're talking about averages. Over on the, over the right-hand side, the best of the best, the S&P 500 with dividends reinvested, it says earned 9.86%. Is that a decent rate of return? Okay, it, it, it is on the surface. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna copy and, and paste those numbers into a calculator and see if it's as, as good as it appears. So 9.86 was the number we were, we were going for. Now let's put some money in there. So we started with $1,000. We grew to 4,787. That's without hitting any other buttons. We can show the rates of return and even though 8.14 is an attractive number, especially when savings accounts are paying us hardly anything, 8% would be a pretty decent number. That's part of the story because we still have to pay our rocket scientist advisor. I could say that because I are one, <laughs> right? So if we put a fee in there of, let's say 1%, knocks our return down a little bit. And if we put taxes in there, Knocks our return down a little bit more. And we, we could always talk about whether you pay taxes as you go or whether you want to wait until the end. And Cameron will touch on that. And I really <clears throat> usually hesitate to talk about inflation because everything is affected by inflation. One of the, one of the, the components that we're going to mention tonight is that the last thing that you want to have uh, your money do is sit in one place. So if we touch inflation and say that inflation is, give me a number. 1%. Oh, yeah. You're a believer. You're an optimist. Well, it's just, throw it in there. Whatever you like. You know everybody has their own personal rate of inflation, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know that? Do you know that the government publishes the CPI index with about 30 different components added to it. And every time one of the components gets out of whack, like it did about um, seven or eight years ago, in about, uh, let me see, I'm sorry, about 12 years ago, 13 years ago, in housing, in real estate, when that component started to go too crazy, they just took it out of the equation. And they replaced it with something that you and I will all identify with. 
military salaries because of, obviously we're all affected by military salaries. So they pulled out housing and they put military salaries in. And they said, okay, let's make that a more realistic number. And that's why last year our CPI published was zero. <laughs> okay, so with a 1% with a inflation, your actual return was 2.6. So with regard to thinking, we, it probably tells us that we need to do a little bit more in-depth um, research and study and observation on what's going on in our world, in our personal market, in our business, in our family economy, before we make uh, generalized decisions about money <coughs> or investments. So let's talk about the last item that I'm going to talk about, which is how banks make money. So when we get our money, I'm going to use Bank of America for an example, and I think there's a copy of the Bauer Report. There is. You don't need to go there later, but you can, you can study it afterwards and you'll find out that the numbers I'm giving you are correct. Let's just talk about how we act as consumers, as savers, as, as Americans, as, as a people, nationally. We, you want me to use that? Thank you. If it breaks, you know why. Because I have it. So we save our money in banks. If I'm going too fast for anybody, <laughs> stop me. Now our banks do something with that money. Can you anybody tell me what it is? Somebody who has not been to our class before? Reinvest. Yes, sir. We invest. In? Anything. Bonds, stocks. We loan it out. Are you in the business? No. Ah, okay. good. Bank, banking okay. <laughs> so one of, the, one of the things that they do very, very rarely is put money in the stock market. Because banks and wealthy people do things with their money that we don't do. They actually do the opposite in a lot of cases with their money. They do the opposite of what they tell us to do. So they're telling us to put our money into different vehicles, whether it's savings or investments or real estate or stocks or bonds. But they do something differently because they're not interested in losing the money. They don't mind if we lose the money. Okay. So in this case, I'm going to use Bank of America for an example. Bank of America is going to take our money and reinvest it back in, in us. Because we walk into the bank on Monday afternoon, we make a deposit, and on Tuesday afternoon we come back, we fill out a credit application, we go to borrow some of our money. And the reason is we don't have 100% of the money that we need to buy the things that we need to have in our lives. So in the year that I have this report, I gave you a report called Bauer, B-A-U-E-R. You can look up any bank you like, go online, uh, pay about $50 for the report, and you can get a report on your bank. And you'll get the same kind of numbers and reports. All these banks, have to report these numbers publicly. Okay? So in the year that we're talking about, 2014, Bank of America took in our savings deposits of $800 billion. Okay? They're holding on to our money. I, I just want to get that straight and out in the clear so that we're all understanding whose money this is. Now, they did pay us a little bit of interest. Right? So, if you had all that money in one account, you'd say, well, that's not bad. I made $1.8 billion <laughs> in interest. The only thing is, it's divided up among all the depositors at Bank of America. So they paid us a little bit of interest, but when we need that money, and, and, and we, we're all in agreement here that they let the money out to us in credit card balances, car loans, mortgages, business loans, lines of credit, um, braces for our kids, etc. But when we needed to access that money, we had to come back, fill out an application, have a decent FICO score, pay some fees, and have a job. And for the privilege of borrowing our own money, we paid Bank of America $44 billion. I don't know if that riles anybody up here, <laughs> or if it makes you wonder if there's a better way. So before we go forward, I want to ask you this question. Anybody here ever have a savings account? Most, most of you did. 
Anybody here ever take money out of your account? Anybody ever put it back? Okay, you replenish sometimes. Let's be honest, sometimes we don't, but we, we try to. And when you paid yourself back, did you pay yourself back with interest? Why didn't we? Because we're not bankers. We're, he says because we're not bankers. Any other reasons? Didn't have it. Didn't have it. <laughs> or how about, how about we didn't think about it? Did you ever think about paying yourself interest on your own money? When somebody asked me that, I said, well, it doesn't make any sense because it's my money. Why would I pay myself interest on my own money? There's another article. Anybody who's interested, uh, give us your name and we will send you the article on EVA, Economic Value Added. And the same concept that we're talking about was discovered and shared with Coca-Cola and CSX Railroad and Briggs and Stratton engines all Fortune 500 companies. They did not understand the concept that when you borrow money from yourself, you should pay yourself back. With interest. With interest. So here's the question. Would you rather pay yourself back with interest or would you rather pay a stranger with interest who happens to be holding your money? This is the crux of our conversation, and Aunt, uh, Cameron is going to, to come up next and continue the conversation, but this is the crux of it. One of the strongest things that we do for our clients is teach them how to think like a banker, because if you learn how to think like a banker, you're going to find out that banks do things with money that we can do with money, and if we learn how to do those things, then we'll have more, we'll control more, we'll earn more, and we'll be able to pass more down to the next generation. For me, most importantly, is I want to teach my kids and grandkids how to do the right thing with money. When I say the right thing, I mean the most efficient thing. I mean, if we all have to get up and go to work every day anyway, why wouldn't we want to have the best return, the most efficiency, eliminate losses? And, and really not have to worry about getting that tax write-off for the loss. I want to I pay a big tax bill <laughs> because I made a lot of money last year if I'm in a taxable environment. We'll talk about that. So Cameron, you come up. All right. So I'm Cameron, like Joe just mentioned. Joe kind of gave you the introduction. You can see over there on the right side, there's a, a general outline of what we're going to be discussing today. Um, while I, while I kind of give you an introduction to what I'm doing, if you could open up your binders and on the right hand side there's going to be the white page that says notes. I'm going to kind of give you guys some notes to write down tonight. So when you guys walk out of here you can look at them later or you can call us back with some questions. But to open that up, pull that page out, make sure you have a pen. If you don't have a pen, let us let one of us know, we'll get you one. What I'm going to cover, right, Joe gave you the introduction to private banking. I'm going to cover some very specific topics with you. Uh, those are going to be the four, six, four versus six. Right? We're going to look at a CD versus a car loan. Right? We're going to look at why life insurance. Right? That's one of the vehicles that we use and that we promote. We're going to look at, we're going to kind of come up with a working definition of what money is. And then we're going to look at compound interest versus velocity. So I think I might be able to answer your question that you had a little bit earlier, if that's all right. And then the last thing that I'm going to wrap up with is someone's annual pattern of spending. Does that sound good? All right. You guys ready? Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to start with is at the top of your page in here, I want you to write four versus six. And what we call this is we call this a CD versus a car loan. And on your notes, here's what I want you to write, okay? So there's what I want you guys to write in your notes, because we're going to go through this. So the CD versus car loan, here's the scenario. I'm going to give you a hypothetical. It's more of, a, of an illustration, then we're going to have a lesson at the end of it, okay? Here's the scenario, is you're in the market to buy a new vehicle. The new vehicle that you're going to purchase is $25,000, okay? You go down to your banker, and you have $25,000 sitting at his bank in a CD, and, he's, and it's paying you 4%, okay? 
You go down the banker and you say, all right, Mr. Banker, what I'd like to do is I'd like to cash my $25,000 out to go buy a car. And he says, hang on, wait a minute, I've got a deal for you, right? And this is his deal. This is what he suggests for you. He tells you not to cash out your CD that's earning you 4%. And what he tells you is he tells you to take a new loan with his bank and he's gonna charge you 6% on that loan. Does everyone understand what I just said? We're gonna leave the money, take out a new loan with him at the bank, right? And so he tells you this, he tells you that you'll earn more money on your 4% CD than you'll pay the bank on the 6% loan. Do we believe him? No. Victor, I didn't, even, I didn't even finish and Victor was shaking his head. Was the concept, <laughs> was the concept me being the banker, the concept behind that, if you're earning 4%, you'll own that 6%, so I guess the concept of marry the two, you're actually only paying 2% interest. So if you come and see me, Cameron, I'm the, uh, Yeah, I, no, I hear you. And I, and that makes I, sense, right? Is that, that, I'll tell you, what you just told me right there, yeah. right, is what everyone here in this room is taught. What we're taught in schools, we're taught numbers, right? So when we ask that question, when I ask that question to clients, is they say, no, I'd never take that deal because I'm losing 2%, right? Because that's what we're taught in school. You take the lesser from the bigger, right? And you get the difference. The reason that I have this up here on the screen and we're gonna use a calculator is because we gotta do the math, right? We have two separate equations in there. We have a CD and we have a loan at 6%. So that's what we're gonna do, okay? So let's go figure this out. Go ahead. Fire away, yeah. But if I'm the customer, yep. I'm making I'm, I'm the customer, right? Mm -hmm. I'm making four percent of my twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah. You just gave me a, of a loan at six percent. Yeah. So rather than paying six percent interest, I'm looking at it like, well I've got four percent of that interest paid over here, so I'm actually only coming out two percent. What if you're actually making money? Would that be a better scenario? Yeah, absolutely. Be All right, great. Well, let's look at it, All right. right? So, Anthony, if you could, if you could put in um, $25,000, right, our interest rate, well, actually, you know what, let's do this side first. So, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the CD, the, 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 the loan side, okay? We're looking over here. Anthony put in $25,000. They're going to charge a 6% number of months. We're going to put in 50, or I'm sorry, 60, sorry, thanks. So 60, what that shows us is that shows us that 483.32 would be our monthly payment. So we're gonna take, Anthony's gonna take 483.32 and he's gonna extend that out over 60 months. And so that shows us that we borrowed $25,000 and we paid back almost $29,000. So $4,000 in interest, right? Okay. Now on this side, what are they gonna pay us in the CD? So we're gonna put $25,000, earns 4%, over the same time frame, 60 months. So how much money do we have? And how much money did we pay? Right? Why is that? Yeah. <laughs> so what did you say? You got it. So, I am a visual, right? I'm a visual learner. Anytime I learn something, I gotta draw a picture. So to make sure that everyone in this room is on the same page, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through this, okay? So in this CD, at the end of year one, we're earning 4% on this CD, we have more or less money in this account? More. And at the end of year two, do we have more or less money in this account? End of year three, more, okay. Now, right, two separate equations. We're gonna jump over to the loan side. We started with $25,000 balance. We paid this down over a year. Do we have more or less money remaining on this balance? At the end of year two, do we have more or less money in that account? End of year three, right? So when you look at these, we have an increasing balance on this side and we have a decreasing balance on that side, right? So what I just mentioned is this is the difference between money and numbers. What we're taught in schools, we're taught numbers. Money's different because it grows. Curtis, did you, did you follow me here? Yeah, you got it? Yeah, you got it? I got it. Perfect, so we've got money compounding on this side and we're paying it down over here. 
So now my question would be this is if I gave you the same deal on $25,000 but I changed the rate if we were to charge you or if we were to earn 10% and pay 20 would we still make money? Got to do the numbers. Yeah. Good answer Murray. He's learning, right? So the question was we did a 4-6 example. We earned 4 and we paid 6. Right? We made money in that scenario. That's right. The next question I asked was, can we earn 10 and pay 20? Anthony, if you could bring that up for me. So 25,000, we're going to get charged 20. 662 is our monthly. 662 over 60 months, right? We would have paid 39,741. 25,000, it's earning 10, not 4, over 60 months. We still made money. Is that a good deal? Yeah? So have I, have I proven to you at this point that you can earn less than what you're paying and still come out ahead to a certain extent? Yeah? Okay. So why would I use these numbers? The four and the six. Right, it's a rhetorical question I expect you to know, right? But we're going to use these numbers. The reason I use these numbers, thanks Joe, the reason that I use these numbers is because this is what you can find inside an insurance policy, right? And a properly structured insurance policy, insurance company will pay you 4% on your cash value, right? If you take a loan against that policy, the maximum amount that they're going to charge you for most companies that we write with is actually 5%, not 6. So if you had $25,000 in a policy earning four, took a loan out against it, and the insurance company charged you five, could you still make money? Yeah, All right? So the second topic that I told you that I was going to cover was why life insurance, All right? That is the number one reason, in my opinion, why you would want to use life insurance as your bank. Right? What we're talking about is we're talking about a ba creating a banking system. And in that system, you've got to have a, a place to keep your, your money, right? a, a place to store wealth. So what we're suggesting is we suggest that you use a life insurance policy that's structured properly. Right? The second reason that you would want to do this right, is because this is what the banks and the wealthy are doing. Right? We did not come up with this idea. right? <laughs> We're not reinventing the wheel. All we're doing is we're, doing, we're looking at what the banks are doing with their money that they have in reserves. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to create it just on a smaller, more personal level. Does that make sense? So if we look at this, essentially what Joe just showed you is banks take money in on deposit. And then banks turn around. They buy billions and billions of dollars of life insurance with large amounts of that money, right? And then what they do is they turn around and they lend it right back out to everybody. Right? He showed you the amount of money that they take in every single year. You don't have to take my word for it, right? But banks buy so much life insurance on an annual basis that they have its own name. It's called BOLI, Bank Owned Life Insurance. Right? Write that down. B-O-L-I. When you go home tonight, Google it. You'll get 26 million hits. Right? It's unbelievable. They've got a ton of information out there. And you don't, again, you don't have to take my word for it. This is... One of the books that I use quite often. This book was written in 2008, and this is written by Barry James Dyke. What he's done in this book is he's gone through and he's, he's um, chronicled, he's written down how much insurance banks buy every single year. It's billions. On page 115 here, I'll pass this around, I tabbed it for you. But it goes through and it, it shows you how much every bank in, in the United States is buying of, this, of insurance. It's unreal, right? So I'll pass that around. This one right here, this next one that's going to follow it is going to be this. It's going to be the updated version. That book was using 2006, 2000 numbers. This right here is going to have 2015 numbers. Right? So I'll pass that around as well. So again, this is what the banks and the wealthy are doing. We're not reinventing anything. All we're doing is we're taking their cue and we're going to put it into effect just on a smaller, more personal level. Right? The third reason why somebody would want to use insurance right, as their personal banking system is this, is because this is an and investment. Actually, let me back up. Sorry, I missed this. <laughs> right? Here's a list of some of the uh, current Fortune 500 companies that are using 
uh, these policies that are structured this way. High equity, high cash value, life uh, investment grade life insurance, right? They use it for a number of reasons. They buy it to pay for bonuses, right? They buy it for investments, they do everything else. Um, Joe has a bunch of, uh, of articles um, talking about companies that actually got started by funding, uh, using the cash value inside their life insurance policy. So we'll give you a ton of information on it, right? The third reason why I said the reason we would want to use life insurance, right, as our bank is because it's an and asset. This is unique, right? They're very, uh, I don't know of any other assets that uh, act this way, but essentially what you're gonna do is you're gonna put your cash, right, what we're looking at what banks do is they put their cash into life insurance and then what they do is they have an opportunity that comes along and they take a loan against the policy and then they go buy real estate, right? They put a bunch of cash inside of a policy, right? And they have a business opportunity that comes along. They're take a, gonna take a loan against the policy and they're gonna go invest in that business, right? Now, why would they do that as opposed to using cash? Because you're getting your interest back. Based on what you've said, you're actually exercising what the banks would otherwise do by lending you money. So you're actually paying yourself an interest is why you would do it. Right, I actually haven't got there yet, but you're exactly correct. So what he said was, I said, why would you do that as opposed to paying cash? What I was looking for was this answer right here, right? If you use cash to go invest into real estate, you've only got one option, right? You've only got one asset. If you use a policy, you've got two because you've got your cash inside here earning for you. You're in this four, six scenario. And then what you did with this policy loan is you went and invested in the real estate. Is everybody with me there? perfect right exactly right and that's why people like real estate in the first place because you're able to leverage real estate all we're gonna do is we're gonna leverage this insurance policy so what art said is art actually said we're gonna get our interest back we're not actually gonna get our interest back until we assign an interest rate or payment back to ourselves to get that money back in our policy and you're exactly right that's kind of my next teaching point as we go on is I'm gonna teach you how to do that right so is everybody with me so far Perfect. Um, before we move, sorry? Interesting. Yeah, so before we move on, we've gotta have a working definition of what money is. If I were to ask you what money is, what would you say? Anybody, just shout it out, right? What is money? Currency, Current tools, yeah. tools to exchange for goods. Perfect, that, yeah, that's what I was looking for, right? It's just a, a means of exchange, right? People trade food for money, money for food right cars for money money for cars right cars for ha or money for a house house for money people are doing things with money that they would never do with things that money buys right so for instance if, if it's just an exchange right would you buy groceries and wait two years or wait two weeks to eat them no right because they go bad anthony might no on purpose <laughs> 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 right? So, right, if, if it's just a means of exchange, would you buy a car and wait five years to drive it? Absolutely not. It's the worst thing you can do for a car is just let it sit, right? You got to use it. You got to keep it moving, right? Would you buy a house and wait five years to have somebody move into it? Absolutely not. All right? So now that we've got kind of a working definition of money, what we're going to do now is we're going to do exactly what you said, Art, is what we're going to do up until this point the process that you have gone through in your life is this, is when you've made a purchase, if you've, is you've taken your money, right, and you've traded it for a product or a service, right? And the transaction has ended at that point. What we're gonna teach you tonight is we're gonna teach you how to take your money, right, trade it for a product or service, and we're gonna teach you how to get all your money back. Would that be okay? Yeah? yeah? Perfect. Anthony gets to do that. So that's going to be a little bit later. He's got two examples. I can't wait. It's exciting. All right. So the next point that I'm going to cover with you is going to be this, is compound interest versus velocity of money. And I want you to write that down in your notes, okay? Does everyone understand what I mean when I say compound interest? Yes. yes. Yeah? Okay. So I'm usually the, the, the slowest guy in the room, so I'm gonna repeat or just kind of give a definition of it. Compound interest is this, right? You have a product, you let it sit and appreciates. It goes up in value, you do nothing to it. That's compound interest. 
The problem with compound interest is that your product has to sit for this to work, right? Knowing that is can you name me one business that uses compound interest or compounding to make a profit? Every bank does that, um, right? You get your principal, you have your loan note, mm -hmm. your loan, you get your principal and you have your interest. So your question is, what example uses this? Every bank does it. That better eraser. Art, thanks for saying that, right? What we're going to do is we're going to look at how banks work, okay? So what I just said a second ago was for compound interest to work, our product has to sit. We can't touch it, okay? What do banks do, right? Let me ask you this, Victor. If you went to a bank today, right, and you had a $100 bill, you wrote your name on it, put your initials on it, and you deposited it at that bank, and you went back next week, and you asked them for your $100 back, would they give you that same $100? Yes. No. Minus. Minus. Money goes out, Minus. money goes in. Exactly. What did, exactly? What did they do with that money in that week time frame? All they, kinds of things. Yeah. They sold they it to it. the FDIC. They loaned it out to Who's somebody it? else. Who's that they back there? Sure. Lonnie, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Mm -hmm. yes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an example of what a banking of what a bank looks like on a community level right Joe shared us with the kind of the big picture one of what it looks like on a national level just huge numbers right well let's take a, a look at what this looks like just here in our community you guys okay with that okay so here's our bank Here's a bank and you have $100,000. What do you do when you have $100,000? Happy pants dance. Let's, let's see it. Awesome, I like it, right? So Gidget's doing a happy pants dance <laughs> on her way down to the bank as she deposits her $100,000. In this example, the bank's gonna pay us 4%. The bank's gonna pay us 4%. What bank is that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use. Sign me up. Yeah. yeah. I think you need a zero and a point in front of that. All right. Stay with me. Stay with me, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we got $100,000 going to deposit at the bank. Okay. So, real quick, before we move on, is this an asset or a liability for the bank? A liability. liability for the bank. Not theirs. What? Not theirs. Exactly. Thank you very much. The Sharpies. Um. Yeah, exactly. Asset liability, it's going to be a liability. Why is it a liability? Because what do they owe us? I can come back at any time and ask for not only my 100000 but for what? 4% interest. interest. So what do they need to do to offset this? So they got to loan it out. Exactly. exactly. Right? They're going to lend it to somebody who wants to buy a home. Be careful not to put that marker, so make sure you... <laughs> make sure I press hard. <laughs> right? They're going to lend it out, right? Because they've got to not only pay me my hundred thousand, but also the four percent interest, and they're going to give it to a home buyer, right? And they're going to charge the home buyer what? They're going to charge them an interest rate. What does the home buyer do with that money? Who's the next person that gets that money? Developer. Yeah. Seller. Seller. Oh yeah. And what does the seller do with that hundred thousand dollars as soon as they get it? Puts it back. Puts it right back in the <laughs> banking system, right? I'm gonna go through three more examples, right? Just to be redundant, right? So now the $100,000 is back in the bank and they owe this person 4%. So what do they have to do to offset that loan? Lend it right back out, right? They're gonna lend it to somebody that wants to buy a car, right? They're gonna charge them 8%. Who's the car buyer give the money to? What does the dealership do, right, with that money? They turn around, they put it right back into the banking system, right? Next example, right? Somebody wants to remodel their house. Mm -hmm. 
they'll charge them an interest rate. They're going to charge them nine percent. And how, do, well, how about the home buyer or the uh, homeowner? Who do they have to pay? Home Depot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they have contract. Contractor, I put construction, but it's the general contractor, right? Then the general contractor, as soon as he gets a big check, he runs down, puts it right back in deposit at the bank. We've got one more, right? Somebody wants to consolidate their debt. They're going to consolidate it with Visa, right? They're going to charge them a much higher interest rate on this. They'll charge them 12%. They go pay off Visa. Visa puts that money right back in the banking system, right? So this is what's happening on a community level every single day. So if you go down there and write your name on that $100 bill, you're not gonna see it again. It's gonna be gone, right? I've got two questions for you here. But I'm still gonna get my $100. <laughs> you'll, get, yeah, you'll get $800, but not that one. Uh, two questions here. How much additional risk did the bank take on in this scenario? None. Art, why do you say none? Because it's they're banking on your FICO ability to re reimburse the loan, one, when they're doing a pre-screening underwriting. So they know the character based on your history, and so they're assuring at some level yeah. that you're going to get some collateral back. And if anything, they have uh, a new car or they have a new home, or so they're going to get their money back somehow. Is what I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. all great. All ask any bank in 2008 what their risk was oh, yeah. with collateral, and so yeah. there's risk. Good point, risk. right? So we've got two two things here, right? Art said there's very little risk. And the question I ask is, did they take on any additional risk? But they were insured too. Yep. They were all insured. We so here, that, uh, the mortgage insurance, the, uh, uh, the FDIC insurance, FDIC, I mean, right? they're insured. I mean, they don't lose money. I mean, they just well, well, well they lose they they, they they lose money, yeah. right? Yeah. Hang on, real quick. So they lose money, right? But it's calculated, right? If they know that they're going to make, I'm making numbers up. They make a hundred billion dollars a year they know to the dollar, more or less, that they're gonna lose, that they're gonna have $50 billion uh, that they're gonna have to write off, that they're gonna lose, right? And the reason they know that is through the underwriting process, right? If they have 100 people that come in to buy a home, right, they adjust through the, their risk, they, they adjust for their risk through the interest rate, right? 2008 was an anomaly. Right? And what happened in 2008, the banking system almost collapsed. And why did it almost collapse is because they had all this money and they're putting their lending money out into the real estate industry, right? And the problem didn't arise with the rates that they were charging. The problem arose when all that money stopped coming back to them. Exactly. So is it more about the rate or is it more about the velocity of money and the movement of money? Right? It's about the velocity, right? So the banking system almost <coughs> collapsed because money stopped moving. It was not about rates. Art was 100% right. I have a tendency to kind of lean more towards you, and I'm a little more cynical. I would say, and the question that I asked, and I phrased it a, a certain way, was I said, did the banks take on any additional risk? The banks take on risk, right, to your point. But I said, did they take on any additional risk? And I would say no. The reason I said no is because whose money was this? Taxpayers. Well, it was, well, it was, my, it was mine, right? I put $100 into the system, and the banks are going to lend regardless, right? Exactly, right? So they didn't take on any additional risk by me putting my money there, right? The second question I have is, how much more money did the bank make than we did? <laughs> that is exactly right. That's the technical answer. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> Joe is spot on. Exactly, yeah. A lot, a lot. A lot, a lot. So let's figure this out real quick, okay? So what did they pay us? We earned four, right? On this money that they lent to the home buyer, what did they make? Seven, right? So they made four, right? Because actually what they're doing is they're going to um, pay this seller, the depositor here, right? So they made three in this scenario. The first one. Second example, right? What'd they make? Eight. 
four, right? Next example, they paid four, they earned nine, right? So they made five. Next example, eight. right? Eight. So they made, adds up to 20. We made four, they made 20. How much more money did they make than we did? Yeah, who said that? So what does that equate to in percentages? Typically the answer that I get is 16%, right? Because again, we're just subtracting numbers, right? That's what we're taught to do, right? In reality, we made four, they, we made four, they made 20. That's five times as much as we did, so that's 500%, right? Joe referenced the Bauer Report. You can go and you can buy that, right? We have a copy if you want it. You can look at there. It shows you how much money the banks are making. They're making anywhere from 400 to 1,900% using our money, right? Crazy. So that is the reason why, or one of the many reasons why you would want to get into banking. There's a bunch of profit to be made. Make sense? Any, que any questions on that? I just covered compound interest versus velocity. Are there any questions, sir? We good? Curtis, you good? You got a smile, man. I don't, I don't, I don't go off the beaten path there. I have a friend who went to a uh, pay one place. And it shows me this, pay, this paperwork, and it says stuff like 123 percent. So if they're, if they're making that from that measly, 20, you know, five times, and yeah, that that the payday loans in that industry. Need to be put out of business, man. It's, it's almost it's illegal. illegal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those, 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 those micro loans are crazy. Right, yeah. very short terms. Right, and you actually work out the math, and the interest rates are unbelievable on those. But yeah. Uh, Last piece that I'm going to go with, I'm going to cover with you is going to be, um, should I miss anything? Last piece I'm going to cover with you is going to be someone's annual pattern of spending. Okay. When we sit down with clients, right, this is, uh, on average, this is where people spend money, right? They'll spend 30, 20, per, 20 cents of every dollar will go to their cars. They'll uh, spend 30 cents of every dollar will go to housing. 40 cents of every dollar will go to living, and they struggle to save 10 cents of every dollar. I'm sorry, where did you get those numbers from? I made them up, or <laughs> thanks for asking. No, <laughs> these, these are pretty accurate, right? Yeah. Um, uh, actually, the, this illustration and this example is taken right out of uh, Nelson Nash's book, right? This book is the foundation for private banking. That's crazy. Some of the stuff that we have that you'll read in here is what we're presenting tonight. Um, but that is what Nelson, and if you read this book, he conclusively proves these numbers. And he also conclusively proves these numbers as well. On the interest side, this is what people spend, right? People spend over here on the left-hand side, and they struggle to save 10%. Joe had already mentioned the average annual savings rate in the United States is what? Five. Five, that's right. So we're gonna give the benefit of the doubt and say 10. In this book, Nelson goes through and he proves that the average person is gonna send five cents of every single dollar on interest on their cars every single year, right? They're gonna spend 25 cents of every dollar on their mortgage interest, right? On their home mortgage, interest on their, on their house. They're gonna spend another five cents in interest on living expenses. This is credit card debt, right? Student loans, those things. So if we look at it here, if you look at this, this is the most important slide that you'll see tonight, in my opinion, right? Because this is the problem for the average person. They're sending 35 cents of every dollar that they make to lenders, right, and banks in the form of interest, and they struggle to save five cents, 5% 5 of their income, right? This is the difference between what we do and what other advisors are doing out there, right? If you sit down with another advisor, what they're gonna talk to you about is they're gonna talk to you about this five cents or 5% that's going to savings every single year, right? And their solution is gonna be taking this five cents or 5% and putting it into an environment that has a higher rate of return. 
What comes along with higher rates of return? Risk. High risk, right? In today's environment, are you comfortable taking on more risk? Right? No. So our solution to this scenario is having conversations not about what you're putting into savings, the 5%. Our solution is this, is we need to start talking about the 35% or 35 cents of every dollar that you're sending to banks in the form of interest every single year. Right? And what we need to do is we need to set up strategies to redirect that money back to you. When we do that, where are we going to put it? In your savings. In your savings. You're exactly right. And where are you going to keep your savings? Based on what you're saying, life insurance. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I'm understanding you're alluding to. Exactly. That's where I'm going. Right? And why would I suggest that you would do that, Art? Because you're making interest on your own. Exactly. And who's doing that before <coughs> I ever started doing it? The banks. The banks. Them. The banks and the wealthy. Right? We got a great article on Vanderbilt's and the Rothschilds. I don't have time to go through it tonight, but email us, we'll get it to you. Um, that talks about legacy and family wealth. Thanks. So this is what we're trying to do, right? Is we're trying to redirect that interest, right? That is going to banks and we're gonna send it over to us in savings. Anthony, save the day. Um, so I just reviewed uh, several topics with you, right? The first topic that I reviewed with you was the four six. Right? My main emphasis and my main point in sharing that with you was essentially, listen, we don't know all we know about rates and those things, right? There's a difference between money and numbers. And what I want to share with you is this, is that you could get into a scenario in which you're earning less than what you're paying and still come out ahead. Fair enough? The second scenario, the second topic that I shared with you was why life insurance are, like I just told you, we didn't create this, right? Banks and and the wealthy families in the nation of the United States have been doing this for over 200 years. All we're trying to do is replicate what they're doing and share it with you. Um, we had a working definition of money. Money is simply just a means of exchange, right? People are doing things with money that they would never do with things money buys. We gotta keep money constantly in motion. And then we looked at compound interest versus velocity. People are the only ones that utilize or try to utilize compound interest. Right? And it's not our fault, right? Big major financial institutions have been telling us that, that compound interest, taking your money and letting it sit there, is the best way that you can make money, right? So most people believe them. Nobody's ever been presented with another option. The other option is velocity, right? It's banking. That's what we're teaching you. Banks and financial institutions all practice velocity. They keep their inventory moving, right? They keep, uh, banks keep their loans moving. They keep their money in motion. Right. Last example that I shared with you was the annual pattern of spending. Right. If you're saving 10 cents of every dollar, but you're sending 35 cents of every dollar to lending institutions and in interest, I don't care who you are. You will never get ahead with those numbers. So I'm going to turn it over to Anthony. He's going to give us two great examples of uh, private banking in action. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I introduce myself to everyone. I could uh, honestly say that we did save the best speaker for last, because uh, Joe will do cleanup here uh, after me. Okay. Um, so what? Uh, a couple things I w we're going to touch on is we're going to kind of show how we can uh, how we can incorporate all of this and how it can actually work for you and in a and in a real life uh, example and before i do that i want to touch on a couple things of for one what we're doing is all we're doing is what the wealthy what the wealthy is doing we're just doing it on a smaller scale that fits your family um, Robert Kiyosaki is anybody familiar with him rich dad poor dad he said if poor people would do what rich people did they wouldn't be poor anymore right and that is just that is just what we are trying to do is mirror what the wealthy and the banks ha have been doing for years in regards to the insurance companies and banks we do compare them a lot because in a lot of ways they are very different business very similar business models except for one major thing uh, banks are allowed to leverage their money 
It's, it's called uh, fractional reserve banking. Banks can actually do this nine times. In this example, we only, we only use it four. Insurance companies are not allowed to, uh, to leverage their uh, deposits. And in 2008, does anybody know how many banks failed? 499. You know how many insurance companies failed in 2008? Zero. Okay, so that is w one of the many reasons why we use life insurance and Cameron did a great summary uh, of that as well. So what we're going to show is how you can utilize that uh, for your family. And what we're going to do is we're going to use one example uh, and that's called how you, can, how you can use this to finance cars. What we're going to compare here is going to be two examples, or like basically two programs. Each one is we're going to, we're going to deposit $10,000 in each program for, for, uh, for seven years. What we're going to do is we're going to put it into a uh, CD that is paying 2%. Does anybody know what CDs are paying, Lonnie, do you know? Uh, you're right, a little bit of nothing. <laughs> yeah, that's ta so if we're given an example, a uh, comparison of 2%, are we being conservative? Are we, right? Be or generous, yeah. right? Okay, now interest on a CD, is that taxable? Yes. Correct. All right. What about interest and dividends on a life insurance policy? No. no. Okay. So in this example, we're going to put $10,000 into a CD. 2% minus taxes, we're assuming the 30% tax rate, we'd have 10,140. Now, if we put 10,000 into a life insurance policy, we'd have about, we'd have less than $6,000. So, the beginning of the race, who, uh, who, is, who is ahead of the game? CD, right? Okay. Now, and in part, uh, and partly because the CD or is using somebody else's bank that they have already capitalized and, ha and have already established. We are capitalizing basically a brand new uh, business. But let me ask you, are you focused on short-term results or long-term results? Okay. okay, everybody says long-term, but really when we get down to the nitty gritty, some people, some, pardon? I'm getting old, so I guess. Well, <laughs> right. So, uh, if we're going to look and compare results in the short term, then then this process really is is not going to be for you. This is a this is a long term wealth building plan. Okay. So, is it more important to start the race in first or to end the race in first? Okay, a prime example of that is, has anybody heard of Michael Phelps? Okay, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to do a small replay of the 2012 uh, free, uh, freestyle. The key thing here is that he started off in the race in fifth place, and halfway through he was in seventh. And d did, did anybody know that? But we all know what, we all know who won the race, right? right? Michael Phelps won. He won by two one hundredth of a second. Okay, it's a good thing he didn't uh, cut his fingernails uh, that night. But so we all know who won the race, who ended the race in first. But can anybody tell me who started the race in first? Who was first off the blocks? Nobody, because he didn't win. Right? Rumor has it th that the, the <laughs> rumor has it that the swimmer who wasn't first off the blocks, his e his own mother forgot he was in the Olympics. <laughs> okay, because if you're not first, you're last. Right? Okay. So, but we just want to use that as an example: is that we need to look at, judge where we want to be, uh, where uh, at the at the end of the race. We want to be in at the in first at the end of the race. So what we're going to do here, in each program we, we put in, we capitalize $10,000 for seven years, okay? 
And then what, then what, then what we started doing is we, we, we started uh, buying a car. Can you scroll down a little bit, Cameron? So Jeannie, no. oh yeah. Oh, you know, <laughs> will we'll, you scroll up one more time? I, I, I just want to go over one more thing here. Uh, in this example, the individual is 26. I do know Jeannie very well. I, w I will say she's not 26. I won't tell you, but she's younger than that. Uh, but now, uh, and I don't know everybody in here, but the ones that I do know are a little bit older than 26, okay? Curtis, are you going to share your age? Uh, are these hypotheticals or actual numbers? These are actual numbers. Okay, the, the reason why we use 26 is because we're using an example that Nelson Nash used in his book. And in his example, they were actual numbers. However, they were based on the, on the rates of 2000 which as everybody knows interest rates have gone down so what we've done is we have updated the numbers for the current rates and also more more realistic terms he does a great example in here but the car he buys is ten thousand five hundred fifty so we're trying to be a little more practical most of our clients we're using buying a car twenty five thousand okay now um now what I'd like to point out in regards to the uh, age, now with cash, with death benefit, I'm sorry, I just gave the answer. With uh, life insurance, it provides two things. Death benefit, which we're typically all typically aware of, but if it's, if it's whole life insurance, it actually provides cash value as well. Now, if I were to ask everybody in this room what, what are you more concerned about? Having enough death benefit or having enough cash value? Is there anybody who would say, I'm worried about having enough death benefit? No. Because no? really, no matter how old you are, if you're 26, 46, or 66, we all have concerns about cash, right? So the way we design these policies is that if somebody is older than 26, their death benefit for this same premium is going to is 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 going to be smaller, okay. And if somebody's 66, their death benefit will be will be even lower. However, on day one, their cash value, either you're 26, 46, or 66, are going to be within dollars of it. And what we're doing here, let's just not even worry about the death benefit here. I like to say what we're doing this is to utilize cash and 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 to have more and to have more cash at the end of the day. So, what we what Jeannie's going to do, we will you uh, scroll down a little bit. Jeannie, uh, you're going to buy a car for $25,000. Okay? And you're going to take the $25,000 out. You're going to pay yourself $500 a month. Okay, Jeannie is a math teacher, so she loves being put on the spot with math in your head. Yeah. But uh, I won't do that. But uh, five hundred a month times twelve is, is six thousand dollars. Okay, so we're going to take a take twenty five thousand dollars out, and then we're going to we're going to pay back five hundred dollars a month for five years. Okay, so Jeannie, uh, how many cars have you owned since you were sixteen? Oh, now, right, or just uh, uh, th 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 that you had, you may oh, whether it's a lease or six. six. Okay, out of all those cars, if we were to add up all the money that you spent on them, uh, how much money do you still have? How much money do I still have? Yeah, Not very much. probably zero, close, <laughs> right? Or Negative. okay, yeah. Negative. So if we could show you a way where where you could recover all the costs of the cars that you buy from now on, would that be okay? Yes. Okay. All right. So Jeannie, here's what we're going to do. You took out 25 and, and you paid back 30. Okay. So how much more did you put in than you took out? I guess just 5,000. I'm not going to leave you hanging. I'm going to... Oh, good. There's an answer there? Yeah. <laughs> it's right here. Okay. Yeah. So you put in $5,000 more than when you took out, right? But your, your account grew from 66 to 90,000. That, that grew by $23,000. Okay, so Jeannie, 
Would you put in $5,000 if you were able to turn around and take out 23? Even if that 23 was, ta was tax free? Yeah. Okay, all right. I'm just checking. I just, I'm just making sure. Okay, so Jeannie, have you bought, are you, are you going to end up buying more cars? Or are you going to keep the one that you currently have forever? I'm just going to keep it forever. It's a Honda. Okay, all right. Okay, so we're going to assume that Jeannie's going to buy another car because she's, she's not going to play, play with me. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jeannie is not 26. Now, now, now I'm telling everybody. Curtis, yes. Okay. Where are we here, man? I'm totally lost. She okay. She borrowed 25,000 and deposited. The, the well, th thank you, Curtis. You know, I will say that we do have this example in here. If you would like to take I a look it at it, like it, does. How, how you, how you it does. It does. It it looks exactly like it. Sure Some people like to look at it, or like the people who like to look at the book at uh, and they and they read the last page. But what I'd, I'd recommend you do, since there are some numbers, if we, if we can kind of go. If we can, if we can go through this together, and we're going to focus on one car at a time. So what we did is, in this case, we took twenty-five thousand dollars either from our CD, okay. or we or we leveraged our policy and, and took it from our policy. That's so the cash value of the policy, sixty-six thousand. Correct. Correct. Yeah. After seven years, that's the cash value. Correct. Based on me putting ten thousand dollars in. Correct. Correct. Okay. okay. So then what we're going to do is we took everything, we paid ourselves back, back into the policy, and now at the end of that first car, Curtis, you had $90,000. Okay. Is that? We, well, we paid ourselves back with, with you. Okay. So we had, this is our cash value. Okay. Okay. Then we leveraged our policy and we took out $25,000 to buy a car. Got it. Okay, then we paid back 30,000. We paid back to 25, plus as Joe had mentioned, we paid, we, we paid interest back to ourselves. Okay, so we took the $25,000 and gave a check to, is that a the then premium? We paid okay. ourselves back through our policy. Correct. And uh, so we had, we had a question, did we, uh, what did we do with the premium deposits? In this example, we stopped ca funding our policy after seven years. So we've capitalized our business or our policy and we're not putting any more premiums in. Only thing we're doing is we're leveraging the money to buy cars and we're paying it back plus interest. We good, Curtis? Okay. I smell a rat somewhere, but <laughs> you, got, you got seven years. You're putting in ten thousand. I'll get seven thousand. That's seventy thousand. But yet your cash value is only sixty-six thousand. Correct. Twenty-five. Correct. We're off, we're off some change here. Cor correct. So at at year seven, we are. At, let's say that this is a marathon, and at mile seven, Curtis, you are behind the person using the CD. We are very clear with that. Okay. okay? Yes. So just quick math. Sixty-six thousand less twenty-five is approximately forty-one thousand, correct? That's right. Math teacher. He's got forty-one left yeah. in the bank. You add your six thousand loan repayment back, that brings it up to forty-seven. The cash value is fifty thousand four hundred. We're paying back with interest. Though. We're paying back with interest, and our po and our policy is continuing to grow. So you're no, we're not. But the policy is leveraged, kind of like what Cameron had pointed out. Your, your cash value in your policy is continuing to compound even though you leveraged out $25,000. Taking back to the CD. Well, we, I'm just looking at, so the interest then, if you have 41000 and you add six, and you earn 3000 that's 47, that, that's 47000 If you earn 3000 of dividends, that's in regards to in regards to the numbers, I we can gladly one on one. I can show you the illustration. And Could I just yeah? This had, this is really important because Cameron went through this very clearly. He said you had a four percent CD. Correct. Right. You borrowed from the bank. You never took money out of the CD. You borrowed from the bank using the CD as collateral. Here. 
You didn't take money out of the policy. You borrowed from the insurance company using your insurance policy as collateral. Same distance. Let me ask you a question. Is yeah. there a fee associated when you borrow? Because uh, there's nothing, there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? Just there is no such thing as a free lunch, yeah. right? Except for here. It's a free dinner, so it's not really lunch. <laughs> okay. But no, Victor, uh, great question. And if we go back to that four, six example, the reason why he used four and six, he did touch on the 4% is a guarantee inside the policy. That 6% that we're paying back is actually what we're, we, we are paying back to the general fund of the insurance company. And to be honest, so did Cameron prove that you can earn more interest earning four than you're paying back at six, mm -hmm. right? Okay, the true numbers are actually different because when we include dividends, the actual interest credit your account is actually higher than four and what the insurance company is charging is actually five. So if it'll work at four and six, will it work at four and five? Yes. Okay, if it'll work at four and five, what if you have your business and you can deduct that 5%? Mm -hmm. and so maybe now that five's three and a half. Would it work at four and three and a half? Right? Yeah. Okay. This is, these are some great questions. This is a, an intro class. We're kind of doing a little more uh, top, uh, yeah, big picture. But that's why, we, but there's, we want to just stick to a certain, like that four and six. But it's, it's actually even better than that. Okay? So, Jeannie, back to you. Okay, what we're going to do is you're going to buy a second car. We're going to do the exact same thing. You're going to take out 25, and then you're going to pay $500 a month back, uh, back, back into your program. Okay, so Jeannie, how much more did you put in than you took out? Five Okay, and your account grew from 90000 to 121. It's $31,000. So would you put in 5,000 to get 31? Even if that was tax-free, Jeannie, would you still do it? Yes. Okay, all right. So Jeannie, you paid back your principal and interest was $30,000, right? And your account grew by more than your principal and interest. So you got back all of your principal and interest? And if that's the case, how much did that car really cost you? Because now what we've turned that velocity is instead of the bank making this money, you are turning uh, your money, and you and you are making the money that the that the banks would be doing. By borrowing from my policy, okay. and paying myself back. Exactly. With interest. Exactly. Perfect. Now. When we, sorry. Sure. When you pay yourself back, where's that money housed? That money is going back into back into your policy. Okay. Okay. Can I keep the difference. What do you mean the difference? Well, if I made one hundred and twelve thousand dollars profit, why am I putting it back? In? So I put that money back into the policy. What we're saying is that you, you, the money that you made is already in your policy. Did you have a question, Sean, or no, are you, you're just chilling? Okay, all right. Yes. So if I'm understanding, if, uh, if there's ninety thousand in there, we take out twenty-five thousand. What you're saying is, I'm earning the dividends on the ninety thousand. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, th that's one of the reasons why we use life insurance is because your money is continuing to compound even though you have uh, you, you you have access to it. Not to mention it's it's, tax, it's a state tax. It's uh, it's asset protected in the state of Nevada. I mean, there's just a lot more of uh, advantages of 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 us uh, doing this. But in this example, Jeannie. All these numbers are relative, 
So instead of driving a $25,000 car, let's say you had a $50,000 car. You would, you would have to capitalize it more instead of 10, you have to capitalize 20, right? But your mo your payment back to yourself, instead of being 500 a month, would be 600, would be 1,000 a month, okay? It's all relative. So that would mean that at the end of this car term, instead of putting in 5,000, you would have put in 10. And instead of increasing by 31, it would increase by 62. Okay, now, if this would work on a car, would this work on a boat? Yes. Would it work on a RV? Yes. Would it work on a trailer? Yes. Okay. Would it work on college education? Yes. Okay. Would this work on a rental pro on a down payment on a rental property? Right? Or as Cameron had said, this this is a this isn't an either or. We're not telling you to put all your money in life insurance, or the stock market, or your or or real estate. This is an and. This will just enhance what you are already doing. You can put your money in life insurance and real estate, or life insurance and your child's education, and so forth. Okay. So and. Nelson calls this the infinite banking concept and the reason why he uses infinite is because there's an infinite ways for us to uh, use this. Now I'm not going to excite you w by going uh, year by year or, or car by car but I will say that each time you use this your your policy growth each car is getting is getting larger and larger. Exactly. Now, and at the end of the day, now, who, at the end of the race, who is now ahead? Somebody using the CD or somebody using uh, their, using the IBC method? Okay, now, how much should I talk about life insurance? How much should I talk about death benefit? Right? Did this end of, did Jeannie take on any more risk? Did she work any harder? Have we really changed her cash flow? Right? Okay, will you scroll, uh, will you scroll all the way up? Let's say that Jeannie had a credit card, or maybe a me medical emergency and she had a credit card of $5,000. Couldn't, couldn't she start using her policy right now take that 5000 out and pay off that credit card. Mm -hmm. Instead of paying Citibank or Capital One 22%, she uh, paid the Bank of Genie the same one. We're not changing her cash flow at all, but all she is, she's recaptured that interest that was going to outside banks is now going to her bank. Now, Genie, if, if we were to do that in year one and pay that extra interest in year one, what impact would that have at, at the end of the race with the numbers? The numbers be higher or lower if we paid more interest at the beginning? Higher, higher. higher right? Now, when could Jeannie buy her first car at $25,000? Year, year four, right? So if Jeannie did that in year four and paid, still paid herself back with the interest, at the end of the day, would she have more, more or less money at the end of the race? Right, so we're taking a very conservative approach. We just ca we just uh, updated the example that uh, that Nelson used. Um, a quick story on this: Does anybody remember the uh, little league team in uh, Las Vegas who won the won the World Series? Okay, well, the the <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help it. The, the, the catcher of that team was one of my clients. And when they made it to the actual, uh, to go to the actual World Series and then they went through all the small tournaments, he called me and says, and I told him congratulations. He's like, well, it sounds great, but we spent so much money getting him up to here with all his equipment and all this extra coaching and all these other tournaments. He goes, we don't have much more money to go to, go to the Little League World Series. And I said, 
you remember that life insurance policy that, 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 that you've been paying into these last couple years? Mm -hmm. You know, do you know, and then I asked him, I, how much do you think that this would cost you if you did everything you wanted? He said, 10,000 bucks. I said, you know, we have more than $10,000 in your life insurance policy. Why don't you take the family, enjoy this once in a lifetime experience, throw it on your credit card, and when that bill comes in, let me know, we will take a policy loan and pay it off. And then you take, then you have to pay yourself back, but now you, you, you can spread it over as long as you want, and you can, have, you, you can have flexible payments, and at the end of the day, you will have enjoyed the vacation, and you would, and you would have had all of your money back in your program. Now, I can't say because of IBC, Las Vegas won the li Little League World Series, all right? But it probably did. But, <laughs> but Chicago cheated. Chicago did cheat it, which is why we still won, okay? But, but the, the catcher who was the second string, there was a reason why he was second string, okay? <laughs> all right? He's out, of, he's out of the league now, okay? All right. Yes? You never used uh, that for a house. Is that because this is not that you know, where your house is? You know what? I you're right. I did not use a house, uh, but why why couldn't you use it for a house? Car, boat, RV. Yeah. Is the interest that you're paying yourself tax deductible, so you get double the benefit? It's going to follow the use of that money. So basically, if this is a company car and the and your business that that's a, a business asset. Then, then the interest is going to be tax deductible. Okay, so if it is a um, if it is for a personal use, then then that is, is is not going to be tax deductible. Now, however, if you have your own business, there's strategies where you can run things through your business and then take out a personal money out to buy. Say, if you did want to do it for a trailer or a boat. I mean, there are some strategies that you can use that. But we want to point out is that this works because you're recapturing interest that was going to somebody else. The tax, be the tax benefit is just, uh, is, just more, is just more icing on the cake. What we want to do is focus on the core reasons on why we're doing this. We're not doing it for the tax deduction. What we're doing is to control the control the velocity of money. But the interest is really interest you're earning. It's just not being recognized as earning, which then which would then be taxable because they're not really realized. They just go back to add the, they go back in your policy, right? I mean, so it's not really an interest. The interest you're paying yourself back is not necessarily an expense because you're paying it back to yourself. Deductions are about interest expense. You, you deduct the expense of interest. But in this scenario, there's no, right, where, where's the interest expense? It's, your, it's to yourself. Okay. Right? Yes and no. I don't think we're going to be able to do the debt recapture. I don't, uh, but. So let's say that you charge yourself, uh, let's say 10% from, uh, from, from your business, right. okay? Is that interest, is that tax deductible to your, to your business? Yeah. Okay, who, who are you paying it to? Who, uh, who's getting this 10%? The business. Uh, your business is paying it. Is this my banking business or my real business? I'm confused. It is your real business. Okay. Okay. So your business, you loan okay. you. you that to the bank. Yeah. You 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 loan money to uh, to your S corp. Okay. Okay. So your S corp pays yourself back. Right. Right. There, that ten percent interest is that deductible on a business loan? Yes. Okay. Who are we paying that ten percent to? My policy. You're, technically, you're you you're paying it to you personally. Okay, so that 
Yes, so that is going to be interest earned. Okay. At first glance, that looks like it's a wash, right? However, there's the IRS allows you to deduct investment interest. Has anybody uh, bought an investment on, on a margin, on a margin, or so, or, or had leveraged some assets? But uh, investment investment interest is tax deductible. So the interest you pay the general fund in Cameron's example is uh, is six percent. That is tax deductible. So when we go through this scenario, it's a net of negative six. So you get a tax deduction of six. And if your policy earns 4%, that is, that is tax-free. Now, there's a lot of ways that we can utilize our policy. And right here, we just incorporated on financing cars. But again, it can be used to finance anything. We just use cars because it's easy to relate. It's, it's easy to relate to. Okay. Now, this may sound odd, but we have some clients that have debt. So, all right, some have some have a lot of debt. Okay, and what we can do is we we can show you an example where we had a chiropractor who had four hundred and twenty thousand dollars of debt, and we paid it off in fifty six months. But what we unfortunately it's, it's very exciting, but uh, we don't have time to. Uh, to do it tonight, but um, we would gladly show you more on more on a one on one. But we can show you how we can leverage your policies to recapture to recapture uh, that debt. And one thing that we do do after you show that example, we can design uh, a, a, pol uh, a program specifically to match your debt and, and teach you how you can recapture your debt, whether that's credit card, business debt, rental homes, uh, commercial property, student loans, anything, anything you're paying to a financial institution, we can recapture that so you can pay, so you can pay that interest yourself. Now, um, in summary, what we covered is um, Joe started talking about our principles of prosperity, which we actually have in your uh, folder and is uh, laminated. And if you look behind there, there is also an eva e there is also an evaluation form. Uh, we also talk the difference between the average and actual. You know that really there, the main thing is 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 having the dollars at the end of the day and not focus so much on rates. Uh, Joe also talked about how in, how um, uh, how banks make money. Cameron talked about the difference between interest rates and uh, and cash flow. Difference between compound interest where your money sits. Velocity, velocity of money where your money is in motion just like banks uh, we talked about how you can recapture everything that you do uh, purchase unfortunately we didn't get to the debt recapture um, I would like to end on this note is that uh, of these principles of prosperity the last one is actually my favorite and that is that is act and uh, you can, has anybody heard that, that uh, uh, knowledge is power, yeah. right? And if knowledge truly was power, anybody with an internet connection and a credit card would be a millionaire, would, be, uh, would have clear skin and would, be in, and would be in great shape, right? What it takes is you to actually act on, to act on that, uh, on, uh, on that knowledge. For example, uh, we have the knowledge that the, um, that if we hit that switch, that the lights are going to turn on, right? But until somebody actually goes, would you mind hitting the, turn the lights on? Lights are on. There's more lights. <laughs> See? There. See, I mean, we can have all that knowledge of, of, of how to turn on that light, 
Here's a prime example, right? But in order for you to get prosperity, you have to put that information that you have in action. You can read this book by Nelson Nash 100 times. You can have it memorized. But unless you take action, you are never going to get the uh, benefits. Uh, the basis of what we talked today was, was what we got from Nelson Nash. And he wrote the, uh, the book, Becoming Your Own Banker. We would encourage, highly encourage you to pick up the book and read it. You can buy that book on Amazon. You can get on your Kindle now. Uh, but for your convenience, we do have some available for sale. We do actually sell them because we found out is, is if I give this to you, you're not going to read it, <laughs> right? But for, but for the same cost from Amazon, uh, we're, we're not in the book selling business, but all we want to do is educate you.